Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, on the behalf of the Canals Brown Bag Committee, I'm excited to introduce Chase Long, a Canals Fellow working as a data policy analyst in the NOAA Office of the Chief Data Officer. Chase began studying mollusks when he moved to Virginia in 2014, after spending nearly six months hiking the Appalachian Trail. At the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, he studied commercially important bivalve species of the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Coast. This work led to an interest in the policies behind sound fishery management and his graduate work focused on sustainable management of the ocean quahog fishery. Today, he will be presenting collections of young ocean quahogs, lessons learned from the newest recruits of the world's longest living metazoan. All right, thank you, Chase. Thank you very much, Hans. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for coming today and everyone online, thank you for joining as well. So as Hollis said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about collections of young ocean quahogs. Let's get started. So, what do you think of when you see a can of Campbell's clam chowder? Maybe it makes you hungry, maybe you think of lunch, maybe it's not really something that you like so much. Chances are, you probably aren't thinking about the actual clam species that's inside of that can very often. Most of us don't spend our days thinking about clams. But that's exactly what I've been doing for the past few years, Den of Nims. <sighs> Whatever you see, I promise you there's a whole lot more going on inside of that can and inside of the biology of that clam than you might first imagine. But first, I'd like to zoom out, way out. This picture was captured by the Voyager spacecraft on February 14th, Valentine's Day, back in 1990 a distance of approximately 4 billion miles from Earth. The title of this photograph is Pale Blue Dot. And that's Earth. Carl Sagan said, if you look at it, you see a dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives suspended in that sunbeam even titled his 1994 book after this photograph. This photograph was taken by Cassini much more recently. It's titled The Day the Earth Smiled. It was taken on July 19th of 2013, uh, about four times closer, about one billion miles from Earth. And one of the things that you can see in this photograph is Earth. Yet again, yet another pale blue dot. One of the things I really like about this photograph is um, you can see the rings beautifully here. And um, for anybody who's ever aged fish otoliths, we spend a lot of time counting rings in hard parts of fish and clams. And one of the things that they did on this mission is they actually used a new technique called ring occultation where they used three radio frequencies instead of just one so that they could examine the content and the particle size within all of Saturn's rings. We learned a whole lot about Saturn's rings that we didn't know before from this mission. This is another famous photograph of Earth from space. This one's titled Earthrise. This photograph has uh, often been credited with really stoking the environmental movement within the United States and, and globally, really. This was a photograph that was taken uh, against orders. <laughs> the astronauts were supposed to be snapping pictures of the craters down on the moon. They looked up and they captured this photograph back on uh, Christmas Eve in 1968. Finally, the one that I'm sure all of us are familiar with, the Blue Marble. This is only 18,000 miles from Earth. This mission was returning to Earth, uh, Apollo 17, on December 7th, 1972. Historic images, like the ones that I've just shared with you, highlight the singularity of the Earth and the balance of its atmosphere and its oceans, especially its oceans in this one. Studies of the Earth's climate have shown a remarkable capacity for stability, as well as a stunning potential for change. In the recent past, we've seen headlines like this. This is just a couple of days ago. The highest carbon dioxide levels observed in human history. Uh, our U.S. climate report warning of damaged environment and shrinking economy. And depending on if you ask NASA or NOAA, you'll get the answer that either five out of five or four out of five of the last five years were the warmest in recorded history. The ways that we look at climate on Earth uh, are often uh, by looking at atmospheric temperatures, such as this. This is a, 
uh, examination of the climatology and, uh, <clears throat> and anomalies in atmospheric temperatures across the globe from 2012 through 2016. And as you can see, you have warm spots and cool spots. It's, it's uneven, um, but we have technologies these days that allow us to look at climate and look at an individual observation and put it and frame it in um, context with the whole global perspective. That perspective that I started out talking about by showing you those photos from of Earth from space. Another way that we can look at climate and change in climate is we can look at sea surface temperature anomalies. And on this one, you'll see the same sort of thing where we have cooler spots and warmer spots, different divergences. But I, I want to point to one spot on this map in particular. This was actually from May 13th of this year. And that little arrow uh, um, <clears throat> in the uh, northeast United States is pointing to a particularly warm spot. It looks like from the, the plot here that it's approximately 5 degrees centigrade warmer than the climatology uh, for that region. So those are some of the ways that we can study the Earth's climate. But there are other parts of the Earth's climate that we might want to know something about. For example, what's happening on the ocean floor? Our satellites can't reach down and tell us how warm or cool water on the ocean floor is compared to the past. Our satellites can tell us about mountain ranges believed to see, but they can't tell us about temperature at the bottom. This particular study from 2017 examined patterns in the temperature at the bottom of the ocean particularly along the U.S. East Coast and up into Georgia's Bank and the Gulf of Maine. And one of the things that they noted in this study was that they have very sparse, sparse benthic temperature data available for which to do this. And so they employed a modeling approach and found relationships between the benthic temperature observations that they were able to find compared to sea surface temperatures, the uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the Atlantic Meridional Oscillation, all sorts of things. And they, and they published this. It's a really, really cool study. Um, they did this work looking at temperature records over three decades, 1982 to 2014. And they actually found that the fastest rates of warming in the benthic waters were occurring in the Gulf of Maine and on Georgia's bank. And that in some cases, benthic water warming exceeded the rate of warming at the sea surface, which is a remarkable finding. But the study did note that there are a lot of data gaps that need to be addressed when studying sea surface or sea um, benthic temperatures in the oceans. What would really help is if we had bathythermographs, a lot of bathythermographs that could tell us about temperatures on the seafloor. One of the things that we do when we don't have in situ observations of temperature, weather, climate, precipitation is we can use proxies. Trees are a well-known climate proxy. We can read the tree rings and we can learn about past climate. We can even look at fossilized tree rings and learn about climates from the far distant past. People also look at rings within ice cores. They look at all sorts of, uh, all sorts of climate proxies to learn about uh, climate going way back in our history. <clears throat> I also just love this 1976 book cover because it's just so 70s. <laughs> I want you to hold that in your mind while I go back to clams. <clears throat> you all came here because I told you I was going to talk about small pre-recruit size clams. So Campbell's clam chowder. The clams in this can of clam chowder are ocean cohogs. They are the world's longest living metazoan. They're the longest living non-colonial multicellular animal on earth. The oldest Cohog ever observed was 514 years old. They actually nicknamed it Ming because it was alive during the Ming dynasty. They called it the bivalved Methuselah in the title of a paper about it. They even published two papers on one clam. They aged one clam, published a paper on it, and went back and published a second time when they said, we're going to correct the age on this. It wasn't actually 450. It's 514 years old. Oldest living animal known on Earth. Ocean cohogs are important because they, they're very long-lived, but they're also important because they are the foundation for a fishery here on the U.S. East Coast. Back in World War II, the U.S. government was looking for alternative sources of protein and initiated a fishery off the East Coast. We started catching ocean cohogs. We started catching a lot of them. This was during World War II, and that fishery has continued through time. And uh, through time, it has been managed 
uh, by the um, National Marine Fisheries Service once that became a part of NOAA. <clears throat> and, um, and today it is, is continued to be managed by the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. <clears throat> but ocean quahogs are also useful as a climate proxy. They're useful because we can read the growth lines in their growth rings uh, and learn something about what the climate of the ocean floor was like where that clam was growing. And since they don't move around, they're really nice, stable, bathymetric temperature recorders. This is an ocean quahog. They're about the size of a softball. This one, probably 100 years old, maybe 200, maybe older. It's fully recruited to the fishery at this size. The periostracum, which is that blackened coating on the shell, starts out as sort of a golden brown. And as they age over decades and then centuries, it, it turns black like this and starts to flake off so you can see little white bits of shell underneath. The ocean quahog vessels that fish for these catch thousands and thousands of them and then bring them back to shore where they're processed and, and using things like canned clam chowder. The way that the fishery exploits this resource is they go out on very large vessels, very larger vessels because ocean quahogs are not a particularly expensive commodity, so they have to use you know, this sort of sampling method to be efficient. And this is two large ocean quahog dredges. These are probably, I want to say, 14 feet wide. They weigh a couple of tons. They're very heavy. And the way that they operate is be, they're dragged by the ship across the seafloor. And then high-pressure water jets liquefy the sediment in which the clams are living. And they tumble through the dredge. And then all of that sediment blasts right through the bars. And the bar spacing is such that it retains the large, mature, recruited to the fishery, usually over 80 millimeter shell length ocean quahogs, the large old ones, and it leaves behind anything smaller than the bar spacing. Because of the way that we survey this resource, we survey ocean quahogs using commercial dredges because they're just so efficient. We used to use non-hydraulic dredges and they would just get stuck in the sand. They'd fill up with all kinds of stuff and it was a very laborious process. You didn't get as good of the data. But today, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service uses these commercial dredges to survey the resource. And what we know because of that method is we know where the large recruited the fishery quahogs are. We know what the size frequencies are in the population. We know something about the age structure because recently we've started to section and age more of these in the past five years. And finally, because we've been able to section and age them, we've been able to learn that over the past 200 years, off of places like New Jersey and Long Island and Georgia's Bank, there's been a remarkable increase in the growth rate of ocean quahogs. It's taking them one third as long to reach fishery size as it was 200 years ago. This was published in a paper back in 2017 by Sarah Pace et al. What we don't know, however, is we don't know where the recent recruits are. We know nothing about them. They go right through those widely spaced bars that catch all of the recruited to the fishery size individuals and they let all the little ones go. So we don't know anything about where the recent recruits are. We don't know how often they're recruiting. And because we actually haven't really been able to collect them, we can't examine them for age, size and maturity. And we don't know the growth rates of these recent recruits. So Enter technology. We've got a brand new dredge. This is just a few years old now. It's called the Dameron Kubiak dredge, or the DK dredge for short. This remarkable piece of engineering takes a traditional ocean quahog fishery dredge and adds a variable bar spacing mechanism. You actually have a completely separate sheet of bars that can be raised and lowered to uh, increase or decrease the distance between the standard bars that are in place. And so you can close it up and catch much smaller than recruited to the fishery size individuals. Instead of having a dredge that's highly efficient at an 80 millimeter shell length, now we can catch 30 millimeter individuals. We took this dredge in 2017 and we went out to two locations. Now, these are very different locations. If you're an oceanographer, you're aware that Long, that Long Island location is located under a really unique anomaly of oceanography off of the Mid-Atlantic Bight. This is called the cold pool, and it's this remarkable feature. What happens is that throughout the winter, the water is well mixed by wind. It's chilled very cold by the New England winter, and it becomes, it becomes cold all the way through the water column. And then in the spring, a spring thermocline develops. 
and that thermocline prevents mixing between the surface layer and the bottom. That cold lens of water on the bottom is most stable right around the area of that dot that says Long Island. That means that it's one of the best habitats for these cold loving ocean quahogs to live. I didn't mention this yet, but ocean quahogs are actually a panboreal species. This population is one of the furthest south populations in the world because of this feature, the cold pool. It's a fairly stable environment, not a lot of mixing going on in the summer. Georgia's Bank, on the other hand, is a highly dynamic environment. We have currents and tides ripping through there. If you ever, ever looked at a tide chart for Georgia's Bank, it actually never has a slack tide. It's just constantly going in a circle, a different direction every hour. It makes fishing a total headache makes navigation a total headache, but it also means that that water is well mixed all year round. There is never a strong thermocline over that dot that says George's Bank. So we fished for ocean quahogs at these two locations, and we found tons of them. We found tons, hundreds and hundreds of small pre recruited uh, size ocean quahogs. And this was very exciting because now we could start to answer some of those questions that we've been wondering about for a very long time. The way that our lab ages ocean quahogs is a little bit different. I mentioned Ming, the 514 year old clam. That was a European study and the Europeans use a traditional approach to aging these animals. What they do is they, they carefully section them after embedding them in epoxy, which if you've ever worked with, it can be a time consuming process, it's sticky, it's expensive, it's tedious. And then once it's the epoxy is hardened, you can use a slow speed saw and carefully section the shell. And then you use an, what's called an acetate peel and you're effectively making a negative of the shell. And then you apply that negative to a slide and then you put it on your microscope and voila, you can now read all of those growth lines in the clam. We needed a way that we could speed that process up because we didn't want to just look at one or 10 or even a hundred. We wanted to look at hundreds or even thousands of growth records from hundreds or thousands of clams. And so what we did is we employed the use of a Lowe's tile saw, and we found that by using plastilina modeling clay, which responds very well to warm and then cold water to soften and then harden it, but it doesn't uh, get mushy the way the Play-Doh does when you add water, we found that it's the perfect material for supporting these shells under a, a very violent saw, tile saw blade without cracking. Then we can take that and put it through a whole series of polishing steps until we get to a one micrometer diamond suspension. We get this mirror finish, and then we can put it under a microscope and capture uh, the end result. And it goes so much faster, so much faster than using an acetate peel. And with this method, the lab that uh, I was in at BIMS has done over 3,000 ocean quahogs in the past few years. Once we have those images, we can load it up onto the 5K iMac, we can fire up image J and we can start marking them up. We mark the annuli within the hinge region of the shell. We verify that the distances between the annuli in the hinge region are actually, uh, uh, they correlate with the distances between the growth lines in the larger portion of the shell. So that's a further way that we can speed this process up by just looking at hinges. And after looking at hundreds of these small ocean quahogs, this is what we found. As you can see along the x-axis, we have age in years. And in both cases, we have individuals less than five years old. This is almost unheard of in the literature. There's very few examples of small young ocean quahogs that are this young in the literature. On the y-axis, you have shell length. And what you can see here, because there are dots in almost every vertical column of year, is that this species recruits nearly annually. This was a big open question. Because we didn't have observations of how frequently it was recruiting in the recent past, there were suggestions that such a long-lived organism couldn't possibly be recruiting annually. It must be recruiting decadally or something like that. This gave us the evidence to say no, that they are actually spawning and re successfully recruiting on an annual basis. So that answered the first unknown with respect to the fishery. The second unknown was relative to sexual maturity. Many people thought that such a long-lived organism and such a slow-growing organism must take decades to reach maturity before it can begin reproducing. By conducting gonad smears, not just on, gosh, over 3,000 adults, but also on these hundreds of small pre-recruit size individuals, we were able to identify a large number of immature clams. 
and then produce a maturity curve. And what this shows is that ocean quahogs at that Long Island station are reaching sexual maturity and beginning to reproduce at less than 10 years of age. Oh no, I've lost my clicker. That's all right. Well, oh, it's still thinking. Is it going to catch up in a second? Sorry, guys. Anyway, um, typically we use the uh, probability of 50%. Try, Try it again. Thank you. Okay, very good. We'll move on. <laughs> I didn't really want to keep talking about that slide anymore. I don't want to bore you guys. Come on. All right. So the next thing that we could do is now that we've got all of these sectioned clamshells is we know how old they are when they reach maturity. We know how old they are just because we can count the lines, but what about their growth rate? Well, one of the ways that you can examine growth rate is by plotting out all of the ages and all of the lengths. And it's really funny to say this, but this project all started because fishery science scientists needed an age at length key for this species. The age at length keys that were available were, were not particularly precise and they wanted us to go out and they wanted us to age enough of these to develop an age at length key. And we found that it was incredibly difficult. Ocean cohogs don't play well. So given that I was focusing on these small pre-recruit size individuals, uh, it's not a really good idea to use traditional von Bertalanffy modeling approaches to determine growth rate. There's some other models that appear that they might work better for this particular species. This is a species that grows very rapidly when it's young and then right around maturity actually slows down remarkably, but it never stops. People talk about asymptotes when they talk about growth curves. All of the ocean quahog growth curves that we've looked at from individuals show indeterminate growth, which is much more like a sea, uh, sea urchin which is remarkable. The Tanaka growth curve was actually developed for modeling sea urchin growth, a, a early rapid growth phase followed by slow indeterminate growth. But we're not quite at the point where we're happy modeling it like that. So we use an alternative method, the growth increment method. By selecting a single year, for example, the length of the, in, the distance of the increment between the third and the fourth annuli in that hinge, I can now produce a number from each of my individual clams and then compare those numbers statistically. And I can compare things like males versus females and see if there's some sex differences in growth. I can compare things like that Georgia's Bank versus the Long Island Station. But those weren't the most interesting comparisons. There was a covariate in the data and that covariate was birth year. Earlier I talked about a study that looked at bottom water temperatures off of the east coast of the northeast US and on Georgia's Bank. And they had temperature data from 1982 to about 2012. That lines up really, really nicely with my mature ocean quahogs. They observed warming water temperatures at the bottom of, of the ocean on Georgia's Bank as well as off of the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And what we see here, as you can see on the y-axis, you have new increment, which is basically in millimeters. It's how big that increment is. Along the x-axis, you have birth year from 1985 to 2012. And the positive slope of that line means that those increments in year four of growth are increasing in, clam, in size in clams that were born more recently. And they're smaller in clams that were born longer ago. Now there's research out there that suggests that ocean quahogs may respond to warming water temperatures to a point by increasing their growth rates. They actually have uh, what is estimated to be one of the um, highest Q10s in the world, which a Q10 is just a, a measure of how growth responds to temperature changes. <clears throat> we also saw that there was no difference between males and females, and that Georgia's Bank ocean quahogs appeared to grow a little bit faster than the ones in Long Island. When I looked at the in, uh, immature individuals, you'll notice that it's a smaller age range because the immature individuals are becoming mature after about to, up to 10 years. So we've only got data from 2004 to 2013, but once again, Georgia's bank is growing a little bit faster than Long Island. What's really interesting though is that those slopes of those lines are steeper. That means that not only is the growth rate of ocean quahogs increasing in these warming bottom waters, the rate at which the growth rate is increasing is also increasing. That's a particularly interesting finding. So, in answering all of these fisheries-based questions, remember, they asked us to go out and figure out a, an age at length key for ocean quahogs. Well, we couldn't do that, but we could answer a lot of really important questions. 
are there recruits out there? Yes, both in the area that's fished and in the area that is not fished on Georgia's bank. How frequently are they recruiting? Nearly annually. What is the age of maturity for these specimens? About six to nine years, 50% maturity. And finally, what's going on with the growth rates in the, in the stock? I told you before that there was a threefold increase in growth rates over 200 years in Long Island and Georgia's bank and ocean cohogs. That increase appears to be continuing in the past 30 years. This is just a fun image that I wanted to share. This is not a particularly old ocean cohog. It was only born in probably 1890 or so. All of those incredible photographs that I showed at the beginning of this presentation, they're all smushed right up to the right-hand side. This cohog was collecting social security long before anybody took a photograph of Earth looking back from space. NOAA was founded right in the middle of that smushed right-hand side, <laughs> established, I should say. The United States Weather Bureau, I, this one wasn't old enough to actually get back to the founding of, of, of the Weather Bureau, but the United States Weather Bureau was added to the Department of Agriculture when this thing was in its teens. Just a really interesting, really interesting way of visualizing just how old these clams can get, can help change your perspective, I think. So looking back, when I started this project, I thought it was all about fisheries. But when I finally got my hands on the data, I found that we could not only answer questions that were very important to fisheries managers, but we might have a way to use this animal here on the East Coast. They say that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of global ocean surface waters. This might be a proxy, the ocean cohog might be a proxy that can help us learn about what those bottom waters have been doing, not just back to 1980 to 1880 and to 1780. And we can actually piece together bits of shell from the fossil assemblages and go back even further like the Europeans have done off of Iceland. So to change your perspective on clams, I give you clam rise. <laughs> <laughs> I would also really like to thank the people who I've been able to work with, down to the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, the Gulf Coast Research Lab, the Science Center for Marine Fisheries, which is a National Science Foundation Industry University Collaborative Research Center. They're phenomenal. I started working on a grant that, that they provided to VIMS, to my advisor. Incredible people in the lab, Melissa Southworth, Teresa Redman, Sarah Pace worked with me on the first batch of old ocean cohogs that we aged, and of course my partner, Kelly Ulig. By the way, this is just a plug. If anyone here ever wants to talk about data issues at NOAA. I am a fellow in Ed Kern's office. He's the chief data officer here at NOAA. And I've been thinking a lot lately about how cool it would be to apply some of the emerging technologies like artificial intelligence to, uh, or machine vision to actually automate the process of aging these clams um, and to derive more insights from all of the different observing data that NOAA has and combine them with this growth data to see if we can learn some new things. Thank you. <laughs> How much seasonal variation is there? I mean, are the annular rings actually singular? Oh yes, yes. So the question was, um, are the are the annular rings actually annular? And so there have been many verification studies. There's actually been mark recapture studies, stable isotope studies, and more. In fact, we just got. I was on the phone with my advisor last night. We got our first C14 data back from some samples of a 200-year-old clam, and that data verified that we were aging them appropriately. Um, the Europeans have, have verified this as well. Basically, those um, rings, and I'd be happy to show you, I actually have an image printed out over here. The rings that we count are, are annuli in this population. Oh, yes, there's there's been many verifications. Yeah. Yes? Do you know if they spawn at particular times of year, or is it a continuous spawning? Uh, my understanding of ocean cohog spawning is that they ripen throughout the spring and the early summer. And typically when I'm on the survey in August, they're very ripe. And um, I, as far as I know, they do one spawn in the fall. Um, I do not know how closely coordinated it is. I think that it probably is uh, happening on many different time frames in that sort of season throughout the end of the year. Um, but I don't believe that they spawn multiple times in a given year. I think it's just once. So. I have one other question. Too. Yes, please. Um, so 
you filled in a lot of the uh, smaller size of the growth curve, but it looks like you're still missing year zero to five, mm -hmm. which you're going to miss in even with the smaller kids. Are there any, are there any efforts underway to, to get the young guys zero oh, to man. five and look at early life history? We should talk. I have a... Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, the question was uh, that we, we've captured a large portion of that pre-recruit size ocean quahog population, but we don't have the ones that are younger than five yet. And is there any effort underway to, to find the really, really young ones from, from year one through five? My answer to that is that uh, I worked with Dave Rudders to go out on a uh, sea scallop survey many times, and they use a very special lined sea scallop dredge with very fine mesh. And I was on that boat for close to 50 sea days over the course of a couple of years. And after the first time I went out, I went back out with lots of formalin and sample bags because occasionally we would stumble into populations of very small ocean cohogs. And in some cases, large numbers. I, at one station, I captured almost 300. I did bring some of those specimens with me today if you'd like to see them. They're kind of remarkable because they're so rare. Um, and although I won't be working them up, I am very hopeful that those specimens will be put to good use to learn a little bit more about the distribution and the growth uh, characteristics of those very young individuals. But it's not its not a great sampling technique because it's just sort of opportunistic and we don't know anything about the efficiency or selectivity of a sea scallop science dredge that's lined with mesh for ocean cohogs. Nobody studies that, so it's tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions in the room, or should we go to online? Okay, we don't have um, any more online questions. Okay. Um, all right. Well, if there is nothing else, uh, we can end it there for now. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, Chase. Thank you. Okay.